So let's review some of the pulse methods. And rather than call them potential reversal, they often call them pulse methods, pulse voltammetry. And the, you can see why. We're taking a, a step out and a step back, and we can think of that as a potential pulse. And that's what we're doing. The most widely used method in which pulse methods started to be used was in the area of polarography. As I said previously, uh, Horovsky and his school in, uh, in Czechoslovakia developed polarography. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for it, in fact, one of the first analytical chemists to win a Nobel Prize. And uh, they developed a large body of literature on polarography. And then also then that school developed some pulse methods as well. Now, polarography strictly refers to one particular type of experiment where they take a thin glass, a thick walled glass tube with the thin capillary. And in that capillary and extending outside it is a drop of mercury. So polarography refers to a mercury droplet electrode uh, pretty much exclusively. So when somebody says they're doing polarography, they mean what they should be saying to you is they're doing it on a mercury electrode. Um, although occasionally they uh, refer to polarography at non-mercury electrodes, and that's really erroneous. The idea of the experiment, the simple experiment was, is if I take a, uh, a reservoir of mercury, hook it up to a, uh, a flexible tube and my glass capillary. I'm not drawing very well here, but. Put this in a uh, solution with, say, a reference electrode. apply a potential to the mercury, and by adjusting the distance of the head pressure on the mercury by, say, against a, a, some sort of measuring stick, we can cause the drops to be emitted at a faster rate or a slower rate, and we can cause the drops to fall faster or slower, just, just so on. And the bottom will get this little mercury pool electrode. Sometimes the mercury pool at the bottom is used as a reference, and first that's what, in fact, they did is if they, especially if they did this in a chlorine containing, chloride containing solution, that would act, actually make sort of an SCE type electrode nice and stable. So drops will either fall dependent on the head pressure of mercury here, or they will fall on the basis of a mechanical dislodging device called drop knocker. There's a little uh, mechanical device that taps the capillary every second or so, something like that, and then that drop will fall off. Drop knocker is actually a more useful method than allowing it to fall naturally because the natural fall time is affected not only by the head pressure, but also it turns out to be strongly dependent on the potential that you've applied to the electrode surface itself. And surprisingly, uh, initially surprisingly, is the potential dependence on the drop fall time, but it turns out that by applying a potential to mercury, you're actually affecting the surface potential of the mercury, which is, uh, uh, ref affects the surface tension of the mercury. So it turns out you can actually observe a lot of physical chemical results by adjusting the potential of the mercury and adjusting the surface tension of the mercury. And uh, we'll talk some about that a little bit later. Uh, the reason polarography is very uh, desirable as far as uh, electrochemical method and also as a analytical method is that every time that drop falls we get a nice fresh clean drop of mercury so the electrode surface is clean and fresh doesn't need to be renewed at any point it's renewed every time that drop falls maybe once a second and not only that because that drop is always growing the surface is continually being renewed even during the course of the growth of the mercury the other advantage is that the overpotential for proton reduction is very large on mercury, so we can do experiments in acid solution without any trouble. 
uh, which would be cause trouble with, say, platinum electrode. So in acids, where a lot of metal ions are stable, uh, we can do polarography on those metal ions. Whereas in non-acid solutions, many metal ions are not stable, and so a metal, an electrode like platinum would not be as useful. Um, the, um, on the other hand, even though the overpotential for a proton reduction is very large, other materials has a very rapid rate constant, so many rate reductions are very rapid on mercury, uh, more so than other species. The surface is also very smooth. You don't have to worry about polishing it. The drop fall also, in addition to forming a new clean electrode, also forms a new concentration gradient at the electrode surface. Every time that drop falls, you get a little bit of stirring as a solution, and it regenerates the concentrations at the electrode surface. And so it restarts the experiment from the beginning, essentially. Well, in addition to the advantages, there's some significant disadvantages, um, which weren't always apparent at the start of when the people started using it. First of all, it uses a mercury. It uses a lot of mercury, and it uses it in a way that often allows it to be spilled and contaminate your laboratories. So some of these old polarography laboratories probably are very hazardous places to be in uh, because of the amount of mercury that's floating around. So that's lost. It's lost its luster for that reason. The other problem is that uh, on a polarography, the anodic processes are limited. You can't really use oxidations on mercury to any significant degree because mercury itself is easily oxidized. So the electrode becomes oxidized, particularly in chloride-containing solutions, it's easy to oxidize uh, to form mercury chloride and so on. Third reason is the theory is very messy. It's, a, it's an expanding drop, you've got a new concentration, you've stirred the solution a little bit, so it continues to be stirred even when the drop is growing. To accurately do a theory for mercury drop electrode is very difficult. And so the theory has been somewhat semi-empirical, although some pretty good rigorous theories have been developed, uh, but they don't include things like kinetic, heterogeneous kinetics and uh, homogeneous kinetics, except in a semi-empirical way. So the advantage of polarography as a, as a dropping mercury electrode has been mainly for uh, analysis. There is, however, a contender called a static mercury drop electrode, which has some advantages of the dropping mercury electrode, but some advantages that are not so apparent. Uh, dropping mercury electrode is here. Static mercury drop electrode. <coughs> Rather than using a, a capillary tube with mercury hanging off it, it actually uses a little support. Often it's a little platinum wire. Uh, platinum and mercury will amalgamate slightly and have enough adhesion so that you can actually stick a little mercury drop on the end of that platinum. You take a little cup and you can poke it on there. Or you can use a little device, a little micro syringe to extrude a, a small drop of mercury. In that case, there's no problem with the mercury drop expanding during the course of the experiment. There's no problem with um, dro having it drop off at some particular time. Disadvantages, though, it gets dirty now, and it still is using mercury, still has the problem with anodic processes. Finally, uh, dropping mercury electrode, that capillary has to be scrupulously clean. It's really difficult to clean it, and if it's not clean, the drops don't work right, and you get all kinds of crazy behavior. And so it's, it's kind of a pain to do polarography, although it, on, in skilled hands, it's a very useful method. For all these reasons, polarography is falling out of favor for many analytical applications. And so we're replacing it with uh, techniques that we'll call voltammetry, which except for the type of electrode material are basically the same techniques. Voltammetry uh, is, was originally used for solid electrode work. So rather than a mercury, a liquid electrode, mercury electrode, we use a solid electrode like platinum or gold or carbon. And the experiments that we do on there would be called voltammetry rather than polarography. It seems a little arcane to have two words for the same basic experiment, but uh, that's the way it goes. <clears throat> 
so we're going to talk about voltammetry and not polarography. The book has talks about polarography uh, because when the book was written, which was over 20 years ago now, people still did a lot of polarography. People don't do so much polarography now, so we're not going to talk about it. If you do use it, the theory isn't that tricky. You can read it. To use it in the analytical sense, you can read it and understand it pretty quickly. We're going to talk about voltammetry. And um, voltammetry, particularly when it's applied to pulse methods. A lot of the stuff was originally developed for um, polarography and has been just applied to voltammetry methods. The big problem with voltammetry over polarography is voltammetry really has trouble with surfaces not being as clean as mercury, and that contamination process is very critical. The pulse voltammetry that started out and was, again, was a polarographic method was called pulse, pul uh, normal pulse, pul normal pulse pul polarography or normal pulse voltammetry. Normal pulse voltammetry is a method in which you start at some initial point We'll call it E sub B for potential. And we apply a series of pulses that have an increasing step size. <clears throat> so what we do is we start out, we have a little tiny step, and then we wait some amount of time, and then we have a little bit higher step, and we wait some amount of time, and then we have a little bit higher step, and then we wait some amount of time, and then we have a little higher step, and so on. And we keep doing that for over and over and over again. And these little pulses are about 50 milliseconds, although it can be a little sh shorter, it can be a little longer. And this time in between the pulses is, um, can be two seconds, can be shorter, longer, depends a little bit on the experiment. So in other words, we're waiting quite a bit of time with respect to the time that we're actually pulsing the material. The increment of additional t potential for each step up is about 5 to 20 millivolts. So every time we do a little increment, we're incrementing it, say, 5 millivolts, 20 millivolts. Probably 20 millivolts is more typical. And uh, what we do then is we are doing does that red show up good on the screen or not? Can you see it OK? Is it, is it better than the black or worse than the black? OK. Uh, it's better, the pen is better, so I'm, it's easier to draw with it. Uh, basically, the idea is um, with the normal pulse polarography, it's like our sampled current chronoapparometry, exactly equal to our sample chronoapparometry. What we're doing is we're just doing a series of steps where we're stepping and stepping and stepping back. And we're only really considering the first, the forward, the forward uh, current. And what we're doing here is uh, starting from our base potential, we're stepping up stepping back down again, and we get a Faraday current. And what we do is we sample at tau prime. And we sample just after, just before we s step back. And the advantage of that is um, there's no real advantage to the fact that we're sampling right at tau prime. We don't want to s sample before tau prime because if we were to sample before, we would just just as soon as st step back at that particular time. So we're always going to be stepping, sampling right at the end of our drop uh, or, or end of our pulse. Maybe we're, if we were sampling here, we would step back at that point. The advantage of step, step sampling at a later time is that, remember, there's charging current also involved in the process. And so there's a Faraday current. 
and practically we have some charging current. We haven't talked about charging current in the theory, but in experiments we have to worry about it. And remember, because of the way the charging current is, it's going to decay much more rapidly than the Faradayic current. So by holding off on our result, we can sample later in the drop the charging current amount is less. On the other hand, which means when it's less, it means that we're going to have more sensitivity. On the other hand, if we sampled earlier in the pulse, we would get more current flow. And so we're, it's a trade-off between the charging current that we don't measure later in the drop or the more current that we can measure if we s sample earlier in the pulse. All right, we're sampled there, and if for polarography, we'd knock out the drop off, or for voltammetry, we would just continue on. Well, the current under these conditions is, um, and what you'll notice is that almost in every case, we've assumed essentially reversible behavior for the electrochemical behavior for our analytical results. And that's sometimes good and bad. The assumption makes it easier to do the calculation, but the bad thing is that it's often not the case that we've got irreversible behavior, so our theory may not fit our experiment as well as we'd like. All right. So what we're seeing there for diffusion coefficient, and so as we make this distance time shorter, more current flows, we should have more sensitivity, but we've got this charging current problem to worry about. We have to wait that long time between the samples to uh, reestablish equilibrium. Every time we do a step back and forth, we're perturbing the concentration profiles near the electrode surface, and we have to maintain, re-equilibrate re the system, and that usually means that we're going to have to wait usually 10 to 100 times the uh, T minus T prime, or tau minus tau prime. prime. And so what you get out of this result is this sample current voltammogram. And depending on, again, how many points you've got, how often you think. It's a, reason, it's a pretty slow method, as you might imagine, because we have to wait two seconds or so between every point. It's going to take a significant amount of time to generate that curve. Not a huge amount of time, but a minute or more. Two minutes, three minutes would not be atypical. You do get pretty good results um, with the uh, sensitivity, not great, but for a simple method that it is, 10 to the minus 6 to the minus, 10 to the minus 7th molar type of sensitivity that you're going to be seeing. Um, one of the other advantages I didn't mention is the pulse polarography type methods is that they're very amenable to computer control uh, because the computer can apply good timing pulses and apply good times between pulses. We can have good computer control of our experiment. And, uh, and so a lot of uh, pulse polarography drove out of the sort of the novelty of having a computer running the experiment and how could we develop a new method that would be specifically suited for a computer control. And so a lot of these started in the 70s and 80s when people were using computers a lot for controlling electrochemical experiments. <coughs> One thing that has really revived uh, pulse polarographies and voltammetry's fortune is the introduction of microelectrodes. Because unlike the um, larger electrodes, this time between pulses no longer has to be so long. Uh, if you remember, the, because of the rapid diffusion times and the rapid uh, convergent diffusion, the efficient convergent diffusion, those re-equilibrium times can be much shorter, 100 milliseconds or shorter, and so the time to do the experiment can be now be much, much faster. And so um, that's a big advantage. Uh, if you have to do an experiment and it takes uh, 20 seconds rather than 20 minutes, it's something that you're really, really going to think about. All right, well, one other advantage, one other uh, experiment
that helps a little bit to discriminate against this charging current pro process is to, is called differential pulse voltammetry. And the experiment is slightly different. In fact, people have different names for what we're doing here. But the idea is something like this. And um, rather than stepping back to the baseline, we're stepping back to some new potential. And uh, we go forward, maybe, um, what do I got there? That might be a half a second to two seconds. This again would be um, a short time. Five to 100 milliseconds would be a typical amount of time. And this step up and back would be 20 to 100 millivolts. And that again would be, you know, 10 to 100 millivolts up on the thing. Now what, what you're doing essentially is you're using the increasing baseline as setting an equilibrium conditions. Um, because this is a, a fairly long time period between pulses, we can assume that the electrode response is at equilibrium. We can assume Nernstein conditions at that case. A lot of times we, uh, we have to worry about that, but because we've got a long time frame between the pulses, the system can achieve uh, Nernstein type equilibrium, hopefully, in the, under those conditions. And the idea is, is that we can step from the base to the uh, step potential, and then back, and then measure the difference in current between those two points. Between the time tau and tau prime. And our current would be measured at that same point. And this would be E base down here. So every time we do a, a step out and back, we measure the current as a function of tau, or tau prime. We plot that versus the base potential. Essentially what we're going to have is a derivative of the normal pulse voltammetric curve. When we do that, and we get a delta, a delta current, it's not strictly a delta, but pretty close. And we get this nice Gaussian shaped curve where E is equal to E max, or E is equal to, uh, or E max is equal to the center of that curve. E max should be equal to E one half minus delta E over two, where delta E would be this distance here. Okay, so the more, uh, the larger the, E delta E is the, the um, shifted away from E one half would E be max. And so E one half would be the half wave potential of the wave that we would get under say a normal pulse voltammetry conditions. So the larger we make the steps, the larger, the more current we get out of it, the, um, the lower, shorter we make the steps, the smaller amount of current we get out of it. So the delta I max uh, at the peak at the maximum amount is NFA D0 to the one half bulk concentration. Okay, and then we get expression like this. Yeah, 
And this, uh, again, is for a reversible system. This is the appropriate theory. And sigma is equal to an exponential function. That's a little bit complicated uh, theory. Pretty much you don't worry too much about that. You just do a calibration uh, curve and then you figure out what the lambda max is or delta max is and uh, do it from there. I guess we're running out of tape, so we'll do a stop. We'll stop here and take a little break.